everyone. Reverend Dorr here from Faith Community Church. Welcome to our online midweek Bible study. We're talking about what knowing Christ truly means. In our last session, we talked about knowing Jesus as our Savior. And this week, we're going to be studying who He is as our Lord. In knowing Christ as Savior, we focused on what Christ accomplished for us on the cross. Church, Jesus' work on the cross is known as his finished work. The last words of Jesus on the cross were, it is finished. In the Bible, the Greek word used here for it is finished is the Greek word tetelestai. And it's an accounting term that means paid in full. Upon his death, when Jesus expressed on the cross tetelestai. He was saying that his work of atonement for our sins was final and complete. Through Christ's sacrificial death on the cross, church, the debt of sin to the Father is completely paid in full. Beloved, unless you understand this, you're never going to understand the magnitude of what Christ has done for us on the cross. There are three key words to define the finished work of Christ as our Savior. Propitiation, redemption, and reconciliation. Now, church, I know these all sound like really big theological words, and many times we'll pass over them because they intimidate us a little bit, and that's a tragic mistake. What I want you to know, beloved, is that uh, because of these words— we are really able to understand the depth of Christ's sacrifice for us. First John chapter 4, verse 10 says, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation here literally means to satisfy wrath by sacrifice to satisfy God's wrath on behalf of the sinner. In other words, beloved, Christ's death on the cross satisfies God's righteous anger towards sin on behalf of the sinners who come to Christ through faith and repentance. Satisfied means God's anger was appeased. It means it was resolved. It was settled forever. And notice how this verse begins. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Church, he loved us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 tells us, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Church, he loved us, and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Understand that God is the initiator of our salvation. I'm going to say that again. God, beloved, is the initiator of our salvation. See, church, salvation is God's idea, and it comes to us through God's intervention. The cross is an invitation for those who will believe. And believing, beloved, is not just some kind of casual thing. You see, you can't be cavalier about your believing. The Bible teaches that even the demons believe and they tremble in fear. Why do they tremble in fear? Because, beloved, I want you to know it's not enough to just simply believe. You have to have a believing that has knowledge. You see, you need to have a knowledge that produces a conviction, which will then lead you to a commitment. Church, the kind of believing that saving faith produces will always, always result in true repentance. Through Christ's finished work on the cross, beloved, God calls us to repentance. 
Christ being the propitiation for our sin means that God can now be merciful to the sinner who repents and believes because Jesus, through his suffering, through his sacrifice, satisfied God's wrath. True repentance and saving faith, beloved, go hand in hand. They're like two sides of the same coin. You truly can't have one without the other. Mark chapter 1 verse 15 says, we must repent and believe the good news. Amen? To repent means to change your mind from whatever is keeping you away from coming to Christ. Beloved, what's keeping you from Christ today? Is it pride? Rebellion? Self-righteousness? Could you be deceived by a false doctrine? What holds you back from surrendering your heart completely to him? Do you think you're too young? Maybe too old? Are you afraid you're going to be missing out on some type of fun? Do you love your drugs too much? Your porn too much? Your food too much? Do you think you have him as savior because you simply said a prayer, but yet you haven't surrendered your heart and your life to him? Beloved, listen, true repentance will always always be the fruit of having saving faith in Jesus Christ. God gives us the gift of repentance when Jesus and what he did for us on the cross is truly the object of our faith. Now, the second word of Christ's atoning work on the cross for us is this, the word redemption. The word redemption means to purchase or ransom. Christ, beloved, purchased our salvation with his own blood. First Peter chapter one, verses 18 and 19 tells us, knowing you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Church, know this. Sin has a price. Every sinner carries the price of sin. That price is God's righteous judgment and wrath. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. So make no mistake. Sin comes with a very high price. But the precious blood of Christ through this precious blood, God redeems us for himself. Now, the term, the precious blood of Christ, speaks of the blood's value. It speaks of the blood's worth. Church, the precious blood of Jesus is very, very costly. God knew the price for our sin was high, and it was going to take something very costly to redeem us. So God took his best. He took his very best to redeem us to himself. There could be nothing of higher worth, nothing more pure than the blood of his very own son. Church, salvation doesn't come cheap. It took the blood of Jesus to pay off our debt of sin. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the curse of sin was set into motion. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 12 tells us, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because of sin. Because all sinned. So if you've ever wondered how the world got into such a mess, the lawlessness, the greed, the hate, the crime, the evil, beloved, this is where it all began. He goes on to say in verse 15, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, speaking of Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Beloved, God's word teaches us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, it says, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Romans chapter 8, verse 2 says, For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. This means, beloved, that we are no longer in bondage to the law of sin and death because a higher law, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free. Amen? Overturning the law of sin and death, beloved, came at a very high price. Our redemption, our ransom from the slavery of sin and death was paid in full by the precious, precious blood of Jesus Christ. The third key word of Christ's atoning work that I want us to take a look at this week is reconciliation. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 through 20 says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God was pleading through us. Oh, beloved, how powerful is this? I'm going to read that again. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Amen. Colossians chapter one, verses 20 to 22. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Church, the basic meaning of the word reconcile from the Greek language here is to change completely. In reference to salvation, reconciliation is the act by which God brings you into a completely changed relationship with himself. Through reconciliation, beloved, we are changed from being God's enemies, hostile and alienated from him, to now becoming his friends in a loving unity and fellowship with him, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Nothing illustrates this act of reconciliation more beautifully, church, than the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. You know, when the son repents and acknowledges his guilt to the father, he's brought back into fellowship with the father. He is reconciled. He is not just forgiven and allowed back on the property, beloved. He is welcomed back into his father's house with open arms. Beloved, God stands ready to forgive us and receive us because Christ has reconciled us back to God through his precious blood. All this, propitiation, redemption, and reconciliation, Jesus accomplished and completed for us through his death on the cross. This, beloved, is Christ finished work. This is his finished work for us, knowing him as our Savior. Now this week, I want to talk to you about Christ's Lordship and his present ministry to us, knowing Jesus as our Lord. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. It says here, to those who believe, he is precious. You know, I, I wonder if you've ever thought about this before. To those who believe, he is precious. Precious, beloved. Now, I want you to understand something. This doesn't mean that you think Jesus is cute or adorable. It means, beloved, you believe he is valuable. He is worthy of praise. He is highly prized and cherished in your life. It means you regard him, you revere him in every area of your life. This, beloved, speaks about his lordship. Jesus, church, is truly precious to the true believer. One well-known pastor puts it this way. Nowhere in scripture does it ever say a Christian is to make Christ Lord. If you are a Christian, he is Lord. A.W. Tozer wrote this, and I quote, to urge men and women to believe in a divided Christ that is Savior but not Lord is bad teaching. For no one can receive half of Christ or a third of Christ or a quarter of Christ. We are not saved by believing in an office or a work. End quote. What does he mean here when he says we're not saved by believing in an office or a work? Beloved, Tozer is telling us here what the scripture teaches us. We're saved, beloved, by believing in a person, the fullness of all that he is and what he has done for us. Amen. Colossians chapter two, verse nine says, for in him, in who? In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Beloved, all that God is, Jesus is. Church, we don't dissect parts of Jesus and only yield ourselves to some of them. No, church, listen. If you are truly born again, born of God's Spirit, 
then Jesus is your Savior, your Lord, and your King. To those of us called to him, who have received him unto ourselves, who have repented and believed, he is Savior, Lord, and King. Lordship was at the very heart of Jesus' redemptive work on the cross. Paul makes this clear in Romans chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Beloved, to surrender to his lordship means he is the ruler. He is the boss, the master of your entire life. You see, he cannot be Lord of only a part of your life. He must be given full control of the whole of your life. Through the work of progressive sanctification, Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, beloved, begins to change us as we surrender to his lordship. Remember, all things were created by him and for him. You and I, beloved, will either bend the knee willingly to his lordship now, or the day is coming when it will be bent for us. Church, the gift of salvation has been made available to us as an opportunity an opportunity for complete surrender to his lordship. What must a person do in order for Jesus Christ to be the Lord of their life? The answer is so simple. Beloved, you yield yourself to him. And you know what that is? That's taking your hands off of the controls of your life and allowing him to be in control. You understand now that through salvation, your life is not your own. You have been bought with a price. Amen. First Corinthians chapter six, verses 19 and 20 says, do you not know? that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Church, we belong to Jesus. We are his purchased possession if we've received him as our Savior our Lord and our King. Our lives are not our own. S.M. Swimmer, known as the missionary to the Muslims, makes a sobering statement about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He says, unless Jesus is Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Now, this is a challenge to all those of us who proclaim to be Christians. You see, beloved, God calls us to bring every area of our life under his sovereign rule and lordship. If Jesus is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. Surrendering to Christ's lordship is synonymous, beloved, with obedience. We advance in our spiritual growth 
in direct proportion to our obedience to the Lordship of Christ and the truth that we learn of him in his word. Jesus sheds light on this in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. He says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? And then there is what I call the scariest verse in the Bible in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, where Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name have cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. You who continue to live in your sin. You who work iniquity are the same people in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, who do not do the things which I say, said Jesus. Oh, Reverend Dorr, you're, you're teaching a salvation by works. No, beloved, I'm not. I'm teaching what it truly means to be saved by grace through faith. It means I walk with Jesus, beloved, as my Savior, my Lord, and my King. And unlike the people in Matthew 7 who only give him lip service, many will say, Lord, Lord. We're called to a higher standard than that, beloved. We're called to bear the fruits of righteousness in our life if we profess that we belong to him. Then our lives must show evidence that we have received him as Savior and we serve him as Lord by obeying the things that he commands us in his word to do. It means walking with Jesus, beloved, as Savior, as Lord, and as King all the days of our life. As Savior, we surrender to him. As Lord, we now live for him. And as king, we wait for him. Do you, beloved, know Jesus as your Savior, your Lord, and your King? You see, as Savior, I know him because of his finished work. As Lord, I now serve him because of his present work. So what is the present work of Christ? Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The Bible teaches that Christ came not to be ministered to, beloved, but to minister. He has served us in the past. He is serving us now, and he will continue to serve us, beloved, forever and ever. The great work that the Lord Jesus Christ came to do was to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This finished work on the cross, beloved, is the basis for his present work and his future work. In his present work, Christ is presently seated at the right hand of the Father. The Bible teaches us that he is there right now at God's throne. That Jesus right now is serving as our high priest, our mediator, and our advocate. 
Jesus, beloved, is still about the Father's business in his present work. He is in the presence of God as the heir of all things. He is the upholder of all things. The Bible says all things consist by him. Think about this great universe with all its stars and galaxies all under his control. Church, it all belongs to him. Think about all the angels and heavenly hosts that stand at his command. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 verse 4 states that he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. They waited his command, beloved, for we're told, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Church, he sends them forth and uses them in his dealings with his people on earth and through them, he restrains the evil work of the enemy. At the name of Jesus, beloved, mountains move, strongholds are broken, and demons flee. And after all this, you are struggling with submitting to his lordship? This and so much more, beloved, belongs to his present work. We serve a mighty God. Amen. In his present work, he is the mediator between God and man. First Timothy chapter two, verses five and six says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. As God's mediator church, he provides a service which concerns those who by grace and through personal saving faith have received him as their savior and their Lord. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 19 tells us the Lord knows them that are his. The Lord Jesus, who presently sits at the right hand of the Father, knows you, beloved, personally, if you have received him as your Lord and Savior. You see, beloved, that reality brings your heart comfort when you truly belong to Christ. The Word of God tells us, that Jesus said, I know my sheep. God has given us a mediator, beloved, that knows us personally when we belong to him. The Holy One knows us personally. He knows everything about us. He knew us before the foundation of the world. And he knew us when we were wandering, lost in our sin. He is the one, beloved, who sought us out to bring us to himself. Remember Romans chapter 5 verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The life which this verse is speaking of, beloved, is the life that he now lives in the presence of God. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. And now being reconciled, much more are we being saved by his life. Church, Jesus is alive. By his life, there in the presence of God, we are saved and kept down here. The living Christ, beloved, keeps us, saves us while we are here. Church, how much more do we now see that we need to know him as Lord? Knowing him as Lord means that I am 
actively engaged with the living Christ each and every day. The Jesus of the Bible, beloved, who died and rose again, who is now seated at the right hand of the Father. As my Savior, I remember what he's done for me. As my Lord, I am fully aware of what he's doing in me right now. He is ever present with me. Hebrews chapter 7 verses 24 and 25 says, But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Beloved, our Lord Jesus is our mediator who is our great high priest. He is our advocate before the throne room of God each and every day. He stands in the gap for us. So when the accuser of the brethren argues a case against us, no, beloved, we have an advocate before the Father who knows us by name, who knows us by his blood. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 24 says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Church, listen. Jesus showed us his work of intercession while he was still here with us on the earth. John chapter 17 verse 9 says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Beloved, notice as high priest, Jesus prays for those who are his, not for those in the world who have not received him as their Lord. Beloved, are you Christ's possession tonight? Do you know Jesus? as your Savior, your Lord, and your King. As Savior, He died for us. As Lord, He lives for us. And as King, He is coming back for us. Beloved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you 
Thank you for the anointing that breaks the yoke. Thank you that your word comes with power. Your word comes with power to save. Your word comes with power to heal. Your word comes with power to deliver. So as your word is sent forth, we thank you, Lord God, for salvation. We thank you, Lord God, that you are now moving in our midst, Lord, and that you are removing the veil from the eyes of those that you are drawing near unto yourself. And we pray for them tonight. Oh, Lord, have your way in the life of each and every one that you are drawing to yourself, Lord. We pray for the gift of faith to be released upon all those who, having heard your grace, can now, through faith, receive your gospel, receive salvation, receive Jesus as their Savior, their Lord, and their King. We pray, Lord God, for a harvest of souls. We pray, God, that you will move in our midst and that you will deliver that you will save to the uttermost those who put their faith, hope, and trust in you. So release your glory, Lord, as we pray. We ask you, make Christ known to those who are hearing your gospel. Make Christ known to each and every one of us, that we may walk worthy of the call by which we have been called. Make Christ known. As we read your word, may we receive the revelation of him so that we can walk in him and live for him and be ready as we wait for him to come back for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, I pray that you are experiencing God's anointing through his word as you're hearing the word of God tonight. I pray that you are receiving the goodness and the mercy of the Lord, which beloved he is extending out to you. So don't turn off this message, receive it. Cry out to him because he loves you and he cares for you, amen? Well, it's been my honor and blessing to serve you this meal from God's word this week. I pray that you'll share it with your friends and your relatives. Let's believe for God to just truly bring, a, bring in a harvest of souls, amen? Through those that we know, Let's become an evangelist and just share the light of God's word with all those that we meet. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to know on behalf of Pastor Gary, myself, and all the elders here at Faith Community Church, we love you, beloved. We're so grateful for each and every one of you that continue to give each and every week to our church and ministry. For those of you who would like to give tonight, please follow the link that we provide below or you can text the word GIVE to the number we provide below and it will connect you to our secure online giving platform. We're so grateful for each and every one of you. We want you to know that throughout the week we are praying. We have an incredible ministry team of intercessors that are praying for you and praying for this church. And we just want to encourage you in the things of God. If you're looking for a home church, come and be part of a loving family of believers, believers who love God and love one another here at Faith Community Church. We have in-person services every Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. 11 a.m. is our children's church. So we invite you to come bring the family and be blessed in the house of God where God's presence is so tangible, so real. And, and the believers in our house, oh, let me tell you something, beloved. 
You can't find better because this is a loving community, a loving community of saints who love God and love one another, as I said. So come and be part of us. Come and check us out. Let me let us know in the comments if you're looking for a home church because we'll give you as much information as we can about our church. We're located at 70 Winthrop Place in Staten Island, New York. And beloved, we're looking to, to connect with you and love on you and help you grow in your walk with Christ. Amen. Well, it's been my honor and my privilege to serve you. As I said, this meal this week, I'm looking forward to finishing this series next week as we look at what the Word of God says as knowing Jesus as our King. Amen. God bless you, beloved. I love you, beloved. And I will see you next week. God bless. <music>